Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 100 with Brandon Turner from biggerpockets.com. It's time for a new American dream, one that doesn't involve working in a cubicle for 40 years, barely scraping by. Whether you're looking to get your financial house in order, invest the money you already have, or discover new paths for wealth creation, you're in the right place. This show is for anyone who has money or wants more. This is the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How's it going, everybody? I'm Scott Trench, and I'm here with Mindy Jensen, my co-host. How are you doing today, Mindy? Scott, I am having a fantastic day, and I'm so excited for this episode. First of all, hooray, 100 episodes. Congratulations, Scott. That's kind of a big deal. That's right. Congratulations, Mindy. When we were at podcast, when I was at Podcast Movement earlier, I think they said that most shows never get past 10. Hmm. So 100 is 10x. Ooh, look, we're 10xing. Um, but it's just a really nice accomplishment, and I'm very excited that we have gotten to show 100. So congratulations. Um, and then I am doubly excited because we have Brandon Turner on, and he's telling, of course, there's real estate involved in this story, but this is the story that you haven't heard of Brandon's past. This is how he started off with money, how he royally screwed up his money, and how he figured it out and is now rolling in the dough. Is that what, is that an accurate portrayal of his story? Yeah. I mean, this is just a hilarious, fun, crazy story with incredible highs where he's, you know, living on a beach in Hawaii now and incredible lows with six figure credit card debt. You know, it's just, you know, this guy has been through it all and, and just had an extraordinary experience. So, you know, he started at minimum wage, racked up again, six figures in credit card debt, build his way out of that problem. So, I mean, this is a wild ride. It's really informative. Uh, it's very fun. He brings a lot of energy to the table and uh, I think you're going to love it. I also think you're going to love it um, because you're right. He does bring a lot of energy to the story and there's, you know, coming from the bigger pocket space, he is the co-host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. He is the host of the webinars. He's all over. He's written like, I don't know, 97 books or something on real estate. And you look at him and you think, oh, he's got his act together. Oh, ho, ho, you should listen to this show because <laughs> he does not have his act together. <laughs> at yep. least not in the beginning. And it's nice to see it. First of all, it's nice to hear that he's not perfect because in the bigger pocket space, he definitely has this like aura of perfection. He can do no wrong, or maybe that's just me thinking that he's so amazing. But I mean, he invests in real estate and he makes lots and lots of money, but he really, really, really started off not doing anything right. So it's nice to hear that you can turn it around. It's nice to hear that, you know, he didn't start from a place of uh, advantage. He did not have much advantage over anything. Um, and I guess the, the moral of this whole story is you should play Monopoly every single day for a year. I agree. I think that is the, the exactly the, the, the outcome there. <laughs> that will lead to great wealth. That will lead to great wealth. You heard it here first. Brandon Turner, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money podcast by yourself this time. You don't have any hangers on, uh, <clears throat> Josh Dorkin, like on episode 42. <laughs> this is the all Brandon show. So I'm so excited to have you talking about your money story. We're not going to even get into your real estate. If you do want to hear about Brandon's real estate adventures, you can go listen to his podcast, um, a little show called the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Investing Podcast. But we're not here to talk about that today. We want to talk about you and all the financial disaster stories that you have about yourself and what a mess you were. All right. That was the nicest intro I've ever had ever. You were so, <laughs> I've never heard you so enthusiastic to talk to me. This is great. I like podcast, Mindy. This is awesome. I love talking to Brandon yeah. Turner. Usually it's this way. It's like, oh, he's here. And then an eye roll. And then I go and talk to Scott. So Mindy, this is great. From that now is on, patently we're gonna... <laughs> not true. I drove to the airport to pick you up. That's true. And you're like, you're like clown car. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Brandon Turner is 47 feet tall and I picked him up in 48. my Acura NSX, which is a little teeny tiny sports car. That I was Brandon... literally bigger than the car. Like, well, I, I was bigger arms... than that car. Yeah. We had arms <laughs> on each side of the car. My light, my head was sticking out the moonroof. It was great. Sunroof. Yeah, it was awesome. Anyway. Hi guys. Anyway. So Brandon, I want to know about your money story. Everybody has heard your real estate story, how you started investing sure. in one property and then you met now, what do you have like 150,000 doors or something? I don't know, 230, I don't know, something like that, whatever. Okay, you know, so I don't want to brag, just 233 as of this morning, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> it probably is, but we're not here to talk about that. Yeah, we don't care don't about know. that part. Whatever. We want to know about your finances. I know that sure. you grew up playing Monopoly. Like I have, I've listened to so many of your shows and, you know, mm. little bits get involved in every single thing. And I know you played Monopoly like every day one summer. I I did a lot of Monopoly growing up. So I was raised in a very, very rich family. So my dad gave me a small loan when I got started of $7 million. And uh, because of, I'm just kidding. No, that didn't happen. Wait, Mindy, you're muted. I don't oh, hear you. Mindy's muted. It's actually a great. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, and thank you, Brandon. That was Brandon Turner from the Bigger Pockets Money, from the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast from episode 100. Thanks, bye. <laughs> no, All right. tell me the real yeah. story. All right. All right. So I, I, I was raised in a Midwest house with Midwest parents who ate steak and potatoes and corn on the cob every night. Uh, for those of you in the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about. And my dad's a meat cutter. My mom did in-home daycare. So we are very blue collar, middle class, like lower middle class family. And I got obsessed with Monopoly when I was in high school. My friend Boone Greenlee, what's up Boone? Uh, and I would play every day for like a solid year. We played almost every day, at least the summer. I mean, every single day of the summer. It's the point where I could, I could, we could play an entire game in like under 30 minutes, entire thing wrapped around. It was, it was wild. We were good. What, what was your parents' relationship with money? Uh, my parents, actually, I, so I love my parents. My parents uh, did not really invest other than 401k stuff. They believed that you can't take it with you. So enjoy the money when you have it. Uh, in other words, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a, what can you take with? What will, what will last? And it's memories. So vacations, trips. So we did a lot of, uh, I mean, at least a couple of times a year, we'd go on a big epic trip and I, it wasn't a, a rich trip. It was everyone pile in the minivan and go look at South Dakota and go see the Mount Rushmore, things like that. And it was an incredible way to be raised. In fact, I, I, I still abide by that today. I'd rather have memories than money. Uh, and so they, uh, they ab abide by that. Now they weren't irresponsible. I mean, they, you know, saved their money and tried to do a good job, but they, they weren't trying to like build an empire. Got it. Where'd you and come so from? <laughs> But, so how did, so how did that kind of translate in maybe like middle and high school years with, with your relationship with money, aside from spending money on buying a monopoly set, it sounds mm. like what, what, mm. how did, did you, what was your relationship with money in those yeah. years? My, I like to say my mom was a garage sale mom. So a lot of you guys know what I'm talking about when you have garage, you had garage sale moms. It means every Saturday, all the four kids get piled into the minivan and we would drive from house to house to house to house going garage sailing. So everything we bought growing up always was used. Everything was handed down from other people or given to us for free or bought at a garage sale. So what I learned was that one, uh, you can be happy in any situation. I mean, again, we weren't like dirt poor, like, you know, like scraping food from the bottom of a dumpster, but everything was uh, garage sale stuff. But I also learned in that about like uh, negotiation and, and discussion, discussion and that no price is actually the price. That was a big lesson my parents taught me. It's like everything can be talked down, everything can be negotiated. And so uh, we definitely negotiated. Awesome. Did, did you, did you work at all in, in high school or, or what was your, uh, how did you? Yeah, I started with a, a small loan from my father. I'm just kidding. No, uh, we, <laughs> I'm just going to keep bringing that back. No, we, uh, I, I did work. I worked as a carryout boy at a Nelson's market, which no longer exists. Nelson's market. I carried out groceries for people and I bagged them and I was a pretty good bagger. Uh, I did not win the statewide bagging competition. However, that honor went to Pete Johnson. So shout out to Pete Johnson for winning the statewide bagging competition. I'm still a little jealous as of right now. So I might enter that again soon. We'll see. But yeah, I worked and I saved money. Would you, so with the, when, you, when you earned that money, did you, did you go further garage, garage sailing or did you uh, sock it away? Did you invest it? Uh, I, I think I socked it away. I'd like put it in my piggy bank, you know, like even like when I got into, when you get into high school, like you making a few hundred bucks a month from a part-time job making five twenty five an hour. Uh, I think that all went to like gas and, you know, movie tickets and whatever else. I tried to save a little bit. My mom once gave me actually, here's a good story. My mom, when I was in high school, uh, I had some change, like, uh, you know, pennies and dimes in my, in my hand. And I, at the end of the day, you'll pull out your pocket and I took it and threw it in the garbage. I was like, I don't, these are pennies. Like, what do I care about pennies? And, and I think there was maybe a nickel and dime in there. My mom found that and freaked out on me. I mean, she freaked out on me and she, I remember her crying uh, and, and scolding me and having a long, you know, parent discussion, you know, the parent discussions, right? And then the way that my mom generally would communicate truth to me, which when I think about it now, how much this impacted me is she would buy me a book. And so she bought me a book on how to handle your money. 
And I don't know if I actually ever read the book, but I remember that making an impact on me. And to this day, I, I like, if I see a penny or two, like, I feel like I need to pick it up and make sure I put it somewhere uh, because I can't throw yes. away money. So there, there was that. My dad was also the, you know, you leave the room, you shut the light off. And he'd, he, he basically, my dad's entire life was walking around the house grumbling about the lights being on. Like, kids leaving the lights on in this room again. You know what this is costing me? Even today with LED lights, I'm like, dad, it's like literally three cents a year for this LED light to be on. Just leave it on. <laughs> it's not worth me getting up. And he, he shut that. That's three cents that I had to work for. But it makes sense because my dad had a crappy hard job that he had to stand up all day long cutting meat for people. And so like every dollar was like a valuable dollar. Like every penny was a valuable penny. And my mom was the same way. And so uh, that, that's how the money story started. We also did not talk about money at all. I never know what my parents made. We didn't talk about it at the dinner table. Money is kind of not a taboo subject, but you know, being in a, a spiritual, religious, faith-based household as a kid, you know, there's the, like the money is the root of all evil, even though that's a mistranslation of the verse, but they say money is the root of all evil. So let's just not talk about it. So that's where uh, I was kind of raised in. Yeah, that's a, it's a very unusual dad thing to talk about making sure you turn off the lights when you leave the yeah. room. Or <laughs> I'm sure it's very unusual. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure what, I'm pretty sure when I go to like your house, Scott, you're like, turn off the lights. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm, I, I know exactly what I'm going to turn out to be like. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, so, so, okay. So uh, this is awesome. So what, how did that kind of carry through to college and, and, and post high school? Oh, let me tell you. So I, I actually, you know, because of all these lessons, I'm, I'm really, I was naturally really good with money. So of course the first time I get on my own, I go off to college and I go to a Macy's and I'm buying a shirt and the shirt is $22 and I can save 10% if I open up a Macy's credit card. Hell yes, I will open up that <laughs> Macy's credit card and save $2.20. I'm a college kid. And it's amazing they give me a $500 credit limit on my Macy's card. I mean, these people clearly knows what, knows what, know what they're doing. So of course I buy $500 with a Macy's clothes because I needed clothes for school. And that started a very fun relationship with credit cards that lasted a good, like, five or six or seven years because credit's there. It's free money. I mean, why not use it? That's what I always say. Wow. Were the, were the, were, was the clothing pretty cool? Did you look pretty, pretty fly? No, I, I, I looked pretty fly for a, for a awkward, tall, oh, you know, oh, college oh. kid. Can we give you pictures? In the show notes oh, at biggerpockets.com slash money show 100. I am going to show you just how uh, I was fly cool. Brandon looked. Um, no, was this pre or post black mullet? <laughs> this was, this was during black mullet. This was, yeah, you know, I'm I was sorry. fly. Yeah. No, you were not. I was um, pretty fly. So, but this is interesting because you are Brandon Turner. You are so good with money. You're this real estate master. Um, but were you paying off your credit cards at the end of every month or were you paying the minimum no, balance? No, no. Yeah, minimum balance. Who pays off their credit cards? I mean, that's like, if you have $100 to spend on a credit card to pay it off or you can go to dinner, like my 23-year-old, 22-year-old, 21-year-old Brandon, 19, 18, 17, was go to dinner or go to a movie or whatever. That's that's how you do it. And so- And charge yeah. it. Okay, and charge so, it. so you're in college, you're yep. charging up a storm like a crazy person. Yeah. And you get to the end of college. What does your debt look like? Mm. I, so my parents, uh, uh, this was a rule for my family. We were required to go to college. First of all, we all had to go to college. That was a requirement, but they would only pay for the first year. So the first year was paid for everything else was on me. So I actually ended up going to five different colleges because this is actually me being thrifty uh, or antisocial, one of the two. So I went to five different colleges, including like a year in high school. And then I jumped from another community college, another community college, did some distance ed through somebody and ended up graduating when I had enough like combined credits that I brought it to a school and I was like, and I did my final year there and I was like, I think I have enough. And then they mailed me a diploma later on. So that was my college. Um, but was I that did a have, strategy? Yeah. Was that, a, was that like a, a, a calculated approach to this or? I think in the back of my head, there was always a, I don't want to graduate with a ton of student loan debt, but I still ended up with like 25 or 30 grand. So I had a bunch of student loan debt. Uh, but I think it was also like, I just didn't want to go to college. So like, I mean, this is literally how I chose my major was I got like, after like three years of a bunch of random classes I had taken at different colleges, I called up the final college. The one I ended up graduating from, it's called Northwestern college, not university. It's like a, a smaller school in Minnesota. I, I was talking to, talking to the advisor beforehand and I was like, well, here's all my, my classes I've taken. They're like, well, you know, if you went with a history degree, you'd get out a semester earlier. I'll take it. So I literally chose my major 
based entirely and solely upon how quickly I could get out of college. Uh, so I, during college, I sold, uh, during that last year then, I sold plasma. Anybody ever sold plasma? You ever do that? No, I've heard oh, it's man. really painful. No, it's so good. It's so good. So this listen, is like an this audience is, participation. <laughs> did, did, this either, is. Did, did anyone in the audience, the two of you, uh, sell plasma? <laughs> this is what it is. So no, this is the greatest thing. So let me tell you how great life was. So in college, uh, in that last year, a year and a half, my wife and I both lived in Minnesota. She lived with my sister. That was a nightmare. I lived with uh, one of my best friends. That was okay. And we were basically broke college kids. So this place would sell plasma. And here's how they do it. They take a needle that's like the size of like a pen and they shove it in your, yeah, it's large. And they put it right in your uh, elbow, in the inside of your elbow. And then they suck out uh, like a half a gallon of blood. And then they run it through the machine pull out the plasma and put the blood back into you. And they do this for about an hour. It takes about an hour, hour and a half of you sitting there. Like, and this is before we had just cell phones to scroll through. So you would bring a book or a, or a little DVD player and you'd watch it and you would get, I mean, for an hour and a half of work, $20 for doing this. Like that's, that was 20 bucks. And then the second time, if you do it twice, you can do it two times a week. The second time you get $30. So you could do a max of $50 a week. And for those math geniuses out there, that's $200 a month. So when my wife and I both did it, $400, $400 a month for selling our plasma, uh, at during college. And it was the, it was the greatest thing. And so no, we'd go there. It's not. No, it was great until like Heather started passing out every time she'd go and then she couldn't donate because her blood was on. It was a really great way to make money. That's called hustle. And to this day, you can't see it right now, but I can definitely see it. You can see it on this video. I have scars. On oh. my, yeah, so people know, people now, when I, when I show them this, they ask me how, how I got clean and they wonder how I got out of that lifestyle of drug abuse. So that's, that's I how cannot I cannot wait my, to see you again so I can see your track marks. I yeah, thought you were going to say, and to this day, I donate plasma for 200 bucks a week. No, but I, whenever I go home to Minnesota, I drive, I, yeah, I drive by the place and I see it and I'm like, uh, good memories there. No, I mean like, honestly, like this sounds, it sounds silly. Right. And it's, it's funny story, but like in college I did what I had to do to pay the bills. And so like I was willing to, and, and like, we didn't like, that was fun money. So like all of my job, I had an overnight job. I got to actually sleep at work. It was great. Uh, it was like, I worked at a home for de developmentally disabled adults. So I would s stay up from like, I got there at eight o'clock. I'd stay up till 10, 10 30, sleep from 10 30 to five. And then from five to seven, I'd like get them ready for the day and then off to wherever they go for the day. So the, all that money went to paying rent and the car payment and, or I think I had a car payment, and gas, I don't know, whatever. And plasma money was fun money. There you go. So lesson learned. If you want money, sell your body. That's a bloody yes. insane story that you just gave there. Stop. That's oh awful. Oh my God. Uh, but, anyways. <laughs> I want to talk one more second. This is painful, right? This plasma thing, that's yeah. painful. I mean, sticking the needle the size of like my left foot into my arm isn't always fun, but it's, uh, it was, you get used to it. Well, here's the worst part was that over time, you do it twice a week, it builds up and it has to do the same spot every time. So you build up scar tissue right over that spot. Hence the wound that, you know, the permanent scar that I have there. And you have to repuncture that every time the same spot. So every time it gets a little harder just to get in there. So right, moving on, were there Sorry any I other asked. sources of <laughs> income that you had in college? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I no. I mean the, no just, the job, job just the overnight, just the overnight job that I had. And so, uh, I did that up until I graduated we gra I graduated at some point. Again, I didn't go to the graduation. They just sent me a diploma at some point in the mail, like a, a six months later when I called and asked them. And, uh, I moved to Washington state at that point. Awesome. And, so you, so you yeah. graduate and what's your financial position? How, what, what's your balance sheet look like when, when you graduate? 30 grand, 30, 30 grand in debt, uh, zero net worth. How much of that is credit card debt and how much of that is? Uh, it's probably like, it's probably like five grand credit card debt, probably 25 in student loans. So not as bad as some, I mean, I know some that have hundreds of thousands in student loan debt, but like, uh, you know, 25, it sucked. I mean, it was like two or $300 a month in payments. So you, you get by, you survive, you get through it. That's what I did. You said my wife. Did you get married while oh, you no, were, we were in college? No, we were not married yet. We were still okay. just, uh, we were just, you know, good uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, cute couple. So okay. it was fun. So did when you did you get married? In Macy's clothes? Yes, we both wore <laughs> Macy's clothes because that's where we had the credit card. Oh, don't worry. I got the PacSun card. I got the, uh, the JCPenney's card. We got, we got all the cards because it just makes sense. I mean, when you can save $2 on some clothing, like 
I would do anything for that. I mean, I, I would sell my blood for $2. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, we got, yeah, so we got married uh, about a year later. Uh, I moved out to Washington state and I rented an apartment. I remember that. So this is my first venture into house hacking. I rented an apartment, a four bedroom apartment. I moved out there with four buddies. We all moved to Washington and we rented a four bedroom apartment and I rented out the other three rooms to my friends and we all split the cost four ways. And then uh, one of my buddies left, the other buddy left, the other buddy left. And as they left, I would bring in just random roommates. I just advertised at the college on Craigslist for roommates. And then I realized after a while that if I rented out my bedroom, I could live for free. So I pulled a Craig curl up and I lived in the living room while I rented out my bedroom so I could live for free. And so I literally slept on the couch and, uh, rented out all four rooms in this apartment and I live for free. Now I'm thinking back, I should have charged more and I could have made money for doing that, but at least I got to live for free. So, so when you, when you were doing this, when you moved out, did you, was this immediate, the first place you moved to was this four bedroom apartment. And this is the first place you lived in Washington state. That was the first place I lived in Washington state. Yeah. And what were you doing for work at that time? A cold stone creamery singing for tips. You ever been to a cold stone? World's uh, best ice cream. I have not. No, oh my I've, gosh. I've oh, never... you guys have never been to a cold stone. Do they really? What's sing? your problem? Yes. I don't know if they still do. They did back then. I think they might still. They did Cold Stone Creamer is this amazing ice cream place where you get, I got paid minimum wage, but I'd get like eight or $10 an hour extra for tips because you would, whenever somebody would tip, you would ding a bell and then everybody in the line serving ice cream, five, 10 people would all sing a song. You'd start, be like, thank you for your dollar. Listen to us holler. Na, 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 na. Thank you. And then they would, everyone would clap and cheer and you'd, Anyway, also coincidentally that year, whenever you worked, you get a free ice cream and uh, their ice cream sizes are like it, love it, got to have it. And like it is like, you know, 12 pounds and uh, love it is like 30 pounds and got to have it. They just back a pickup truck to your house and unload it. <laughs> and so I would get a got to have it size every single time I worked, which is like six days a week. So not only did I gain some debt that year, a little bit more of the JC Penney's Macy stuff, I also gained 40 pounds in one year. So that's how that works. Wow. Nice job. And, but when, with the house hacking concept, were you able, so, okay. So, so between even, even with the house hacking and the, yeah. and the job and the, the tips, I still spent money on stupid stuff. Okay. So what, when, when was the, the kind of the next inflection point where maybe where you, maybe where you started starting sure. to change your trajectory yeah. with your finances? Yeah. So let me fast forward the next couple of years. So wife and I got married about a year later or so, I don't know, somewhere in that we got married. Uh, and at the time I had bought a house. So after the four bedroom apartment thing, and after I graduated college and after all those things happened, I finally settled down in Grays Harbor, Washington. It's like the armpit of Washington state. Uh, beautiful, just, um, very low, uh, low prices and, uh, no jobs and rough people. And I, I, I was talking to a friend who her sister who was there is a real estate agent. And I was saying, I'm looking for a house to rent. And she said, well, why don't you just buy a house? It's cheaper than renting. And I was like, there's no way that's true. And she's like, no, it is. And so I looked at the numbers and I called up a lender and they're like, I mean, this is essentially how the conversation went was like, so, uh, what's your, you know, what's your credit like? Oh, I don't really have any credit other than, you know, some massive credit card debt. I mean, for a 21 year old or 22 year old, I turn the credit card debt. I'm like, okay, well, you know, like what's your income? Like I make minimum wage. Okay. And you know, what, what else you got going in life? Like really no, nothing whatsoever. How much savings do you have? Nothing. Okay, great. You're approved for $300,000 loan. <laughs> this was, this was 2007, the glory days of real estate. Uh, they just gave, they're like, we'll just do a no doc loan and say that you're a doctor. Perfect. Let's do that. And so we, we did that and we bought a house. Now, luckily this bring back the, the, the garage sale mom. What I learned from my mom was that like everything, like like buy bargain stuff. You can buy used, you can buy, you know, junky stuff. You can fix it up even. And so I bought the cheap, I just asked my agent, what's the cheapest house in town? And it was an $89,000 little Rambler house. And I was like, all right, let's get that one. And so we put in an offer, we bought the house. And then I went to Home Depot and bought a book called one, two, three Home Depot and one, two, three Home Improvement from Home Depot. And I learned how to like do stuff and I fixed it up a little bit and we sold it like a year later, like after we, like we got married, wife moved in, roommates all moved out. So I was house hacking there as well. Uh, roommates moved out, wife moved in, we sold the house. Then we made $25,000 and, uh, it was enough to really like pay off the car that my wife had bought and pay for our wedding. Uh, we got married and the, you know, pay off the wedding that we'd put on credit card. And now we were, uh, we were adults at that point and everything was smooth sailing since then. Thank you guys. <laughs> 
you were horrible with money. Why are you on this show? <laughs> that was so bad. So let me tell you what it, let me tell you what it changed. We'll bring up to the, to, to the modern a little bit more. So we started flipping houses uh, because I just thought there'd be a fun business. So I was watching the flipping TV shows with flip houses. That was in 07 and 08. We all remember how great the real estate market was in 07 and 08. And so I would buy properties and then just the market just dropped more and more and more and I couldn't sell them. So I ended up with a few houses that I couldn't sell, turned them into rental properties. And of course, I mean, as any genius would do, I put all the repairs on credit cards uh, for those early houses. Because, I mean, come on, I mean, all the books said to do that because you're just going to sell the house and pay it off anyway. Who cares? So now at that point, I probably had 80000 in credit card debt, I'm thinking, after that. And I own some rental properties, uh, which is great. Uh, <laughs> and they weren't good <laughs> rental properties. <laughs> so... I'm, I'm glad that I, I shouldn't be saying this to you guys. Cause you guys like think that I'm like good at giving advice here, but this is how I started. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking wow, myself, amazing. Wait, when does he start being good with money? Cause he's horrible. No, so that brings me up to last week. Let's just go back a little bit here. So, so you sell, <laughs> you buy your first house, you buy one, two, yeah. three home and home fix did, it up. Yeah, one you, day, one you day fix home it up. Improvement. Your- <laughs> I still have that book to this day, the same copy. Yeah. You anyway. fix it up yourself. You sell it for twenty five thousand dollars. You yep. pay off the car and get a wedding, and now you're you're back to broke. Are you right? Yes. Are you making yeah. minimum wage still? Uh, at that point, I had moved up to a new job. I worked at a well. I was trying, actually no. I had no job for a little while. I was trying to flip houses. When that kind of all crashed around me and I couldn't do it, I had to get a loan on those houses. Couldn't get a loan without a job, so I went back and got a job at a bank. Now I was making thirteen dollars an hour, the most money I'd ever made in my entire life, and I was rolling in it. I mean, like, how, literally, how old were you at this point? Literally. 23, I think at that point, 23, 24, probably okay, 23. So, so you're 23, you're, you're, you're broke, but you're not in debt because of the, the house oh, situation. Yeah, I still had, now I had the credit card debt from all the flips. So we okay, still had the credit card debt. Okay, fair enough. Lots so of that. Before you got to the first flip, after you sold the house, how, yeah. did you, how did you get into the next property? Hard money. So we hard just money. use hard money. Hard money, hard money lenders for all those. So for those who don't know hard money, they are companies who will actually lend flippers money to buy a house. So they would lend me the money to buy the house. I'd put the repairs on credit card and then I would do the work myself. Now in a perfect world, that's fine. I mean, credit, like, you know, I'd pay out the credit cards when the house sells, everybody wins, you know, and you know, I get some good miles out of the credit cards. But when the house doesn't sell and you have to go and refinance, it means go to a bank and get a normal loan on it. I couldn't get enough of a normal loan to pay off all that credit card usually. And so I did this like three or four times. I had to refinance all these properties and then I just ended up with like, yeah, almost a hundred thousand dollars that they got one point in credit cards, yeah. uh, credit card debt, which was great. So some of our users are not totally familiar with this sure. concept or some of our listeners, right? So, so a hard money loan, you're going to a private individual or a private bank and you're borrowing at like 12, 15% interest rate, right? Yes. Yeah. I think it was 12. It was, here's a, it was 12% interest that I'm paying the hard money lender and tw- uh, what was it? 12 and no, 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 no. It was 10 and 10, 10% interest. So it sounds bad. And 10% fee on whatever it is that I borrowed. So if I borrowed a hundred grand, it was a $10,000 fee plus 10% interest per year, uh, so, you know, paid monthly. So it's really like 20% if you kept it for a year. So really can, good deal. I can do those <laughs> loans for you anytime you want, Brandon. I, I bet you can. <laughs> and, and then you're financing the repairs with a credit card. What's the interest 20, rate on the credit card? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure high 20s because this was uh, like mostly Home Depot cards. So I, I think I have, still to this day, I never canceled any of them. I think I have five Home Depot cards uh, that I would just max out because Home Depot is cool because they give you six months of no interest, no payments. But if you didn't pay it off in six months, it would retroactively go add on 29% interest from the beginning, all, and I never paid any of them off within six months because I never sold any of those properties. So I ended up just with just tons of credit card debt. So you're borrowing, you're borrowing at rates of between 20 and 30% <laughs> annually to finance flips, which are then going down in value even after yes. you're improving them because of the market conditions, right? Yes. Yeah. And not knowing what I was doing and doing all the work myself and having no time for a job. I mean, you know, I had to finally get that job and stop flipping because it was a rough time. What was, was a rough you- time. What was rock bottom at this, from, from this, uh, yeah. this ex- exploit so here? I, I moved from a, from, so we sold one of our house. We turned most of our houses into rentals. I flipped one. Uh, I bought this house. I flipped it. I couldn't sell it. So I moved into it. Finally, I was able to sell it and broke even on it. Just one of my other flips. And I'm like, this is bad. I don't know where to, now where am I going to live? I got to go find a rental. And at that time, somebody was like, well, Hey, my, the, like this guy, I know he's my, my, basically my real estate mentor. 
Um, he said, my church has a parsonage. So parsonage is, a, is like a house next door to a church where the pastor or the, or the priest lives. We have a parsonage that we is currently vacant because they didn't have a pastor at the time. They were looking for a new one. And it's a complete rehab. It's, it needs, needs to be fixed up. Do you want to live for free there in exchange for fi- you do the work to fix it up and they'll buy materials? I said, that sounds like a great solution. So I moved in there and I did all the work. And at that point, I remember, I don't remember how I got connected with it. I think I actually might've watched a YouTube video from Dave Ramsey. So this is, I mean, this is like low point, right? Like I'm still owning rent. I'm still buying rentals at this point. I think I have at this point, half a dozen, I might even had a dozen rentals at this point. Because, and you're not doing them because you want to buy rentals. You're doing them because you can't sell them. I couldn't profit. sell them. Yeah. A couple and of them. You couldn't like, them. Yeah. A couple of them were actually like rentals that I actually wanted. Uh, Cause at this point I realized, so here's what I remember about when I bought my, I bought a duplex early on and I lived in half of it and I rented the other half out. And I remember my tenants walking over and handing me $650 in rent. And I remember holding that money. Now I don't take money in cash anymore. That's silly, but I would hold this. I held this money and I'm like this $650, my mortgage is 620. And I remember like at that duplex living for free. And I remember this thing just hitting me like, Oh my gosh, like I'm living for free. And if I move out of here, which I did now, anything above that is just pure profit. And if I just own like a hundred of these, or I think it's dumb. It's like, if I own 30 of these, I could retire. I could like just quit my job. And that's when I really jumped in like to buy rentals. Cause I was like, I set a goal. I'm going to buy 30 units uh, and started so you, doing so. You discovered that concept in that moment or was there a book that's when or it, other? There's or- many books. Yeah, many books. But I remember that one, that's when it became real. I mean, I, when I got into real estate the very first time, very first house, I read a hundred books. I went to the local library and I got every single book they had over the course of a summer. And that's all I did all summer long was read a hundred books on real estate. Every book in the entire library system, like all the other libraries in the area, they would ship their books in because I would just reserve them. And I read a hundred books on real estate in one summer. Cause I was obsessed and it, I want to know. So was that, was that before or after you had that concept happen? Uh, that would have been before that concept happened. Okay. So like I knew in my head how that worked, but it wasn't until I held that money that I was like, Oh, this is like, and most of the books I read were on flipping. Cause at the time, like, like I feel like flipping was like all the rage. There was like 400 shows on flipping. Like all it was, was flipping, 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 flipping. So that's what made it made me think I'm going to just buy rentals. And that's when I got in the rental world. I want to know how you convinced your new wife mm-hmm. to continue to allow you to buy these properties <laughs> that you can't sell. You've got $100,000 in credit card debt. I love real estate. I have always loved real estate. I will always love real estate. I would not have let you, Brandon Turner, be my husband and continue to buy all this with $100,000 in credit card debt and houses you can't sell that are worth less than you bought them for after you put more money into them. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so not to be judgy, but no. how did you convince her? Yeah. Uh, the short answer is my wife has unwavering faith in me. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's one thing. Um, it, here's here's actually how I, here's how I, in the same way I communicate to a lot of people on how to convince your spouse to do anything money related because money is a hard thing with spouses. Uh, I believe that media is probably one of the best ways to convince somebody. Cause if you tell somebody something like your spouse, like, Hey, we're going to go buy rental properties or we need to save more money. They're going to be like, you know, whatever. I'm not going to do that. You're just telling me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. But so I asked her to read rich dad, poor dad. Uh, That was one of the first books I read. It made a big impact on me. And so I had to read that. So at least we're in the same mindset. It changed her mind the same way it's changed millions of people's mindsets over the years is reading rich dad, poor dad, I think helped a lot. Uh, But still like, and, and, I just trusted and both of us trusted the process. We knew that the process worked by acquiring assets that produced positive cash flow. And then over time, those properties would go up in value and the mortgage would be, be, be paid down. We knew that if we just trusted that long enough to hang on, we would get through it. And now every month, I'd, or every month, every day, I'd be like, oh, this is not working but I trusted the process that someday it would work. And I really believe that. Uh, and it worked. I mean, it, it did over time. It takes, it takes a lot longer than people think it took, I've, it's been 14 years now. And now those properties produce really nice cash flow, and they're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars more than I paid for them. But it's taken me 13 or 14 years now. And some of them still are worth what I paid for them. Some of them have not gone up at all because I bought in crap areas, but some of them have. So, so with, with this, when you had this inflection point, when you held that money in your hand, what, yeah. what about your behavior or strategy changed in the, in the months following that inflection point, if anything? 
I think it just became a matter of we're going to buy more of these. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I just said, I'm going to buy rental properties because I, I realized if I just had, this is my math in my head. If I had 30 units that each profited hundred dollars per month per unit. So that could be a fourplex making $400 and eightplex $800. Didn't matter. If I could just make a profit after all the bills have been paid of hundred dollars, I just needed 30 of them to be able to quit my job and retire because $3,000 a month was enough to at least live in a cheap area and pay my bill. I call that level one financial freedom. It's like I can pay my bills and survive on my cash flow. Uh, level two financial freedom is like I can buy a private jet and move to Hawaii. And, you know, level three is like I can buy the New York jets and that's a good level to get to as well. That's where I'm aiming. Ah, that's, that's, that's how we get there. That's a big jump. New York, <laughs> New York jets though, they're not very good. <laughs> not very big. Not very good. Uh, it's a big goal. I don't want that. But I'm just saying that's level three, like Gary Vaynerchuk, that's his goal, right? To buy the jets and like yeah. his goal, that's like he wants that level three financial freedom. Like I'm, I feel like I'm at like level like two right now where like I could buy, not a private jet, but I could at least buy like a nice house in Hawaii and kind of do whatever I want. But level three is like, I can like really like, I could own a, I could own like a kingdom and that sounds fun. There I won't go. get there. Anyway, uh, so I, I got another story though. If you want me to throw in like the next inflection point, uh, cause you asked me like where, where was rock bottom? That wasn't the money. Rock bottom was when I was living in that parsonage. And I, I watched a YouTube video on Dave Ramsey and I mean, I, every, I mean, we were struggling. We were putting food on, on credit. I mean, we were living for free and we were putting food on credit cards and putting like going to restaurants and putting it on credit card because we couldn't pay it. And we'd get a hit with a medical thing or our dog would get sick or, or a cat, I think at the time. And that's like $800 for the cat and that goes on credit card. And like, we just could not get ahead. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why. And it really like, I couldn't figure out why. So finally I watched this video from Dave Ramsey and I was like, oh, that, that guy looks interesting. So I read Total Money Makeover from Dave Ramsey and like my head exploded, like just, you know, everywhere. And I was like, I need to have a budget. Like, I don't even know what I'm spending. And so I, I downloaded my bank statement and all my spending and I categorized everything and then I looked at all my income because at the time, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't making that much. Anyway, I looked at everything and I was spending a thousand dollars a month more than I was making. And I was always making like three grand a month. So I think I was spending four and making three. So I was 25% like over what, like, and I was like, no wonder, no wonder I'm, I'm, I'm barely hanging on here. And I was living for free. So it just shows to show you that house hacking, even if you're living for free, doesn't solve everything because like it, there's still a heart issue there. There's still a, an envy, agree. They, I need to have this because it's, I want it thing. Like I'm going to go out to dinner because I want it because I deserve it. And here's the shocking thing that day we made a plan. We made a budget. We went hardcore. We, we went and got envelopes. Like my wife, I had to read it as well. Cause again, I think reading is important. We went and bought this big envelope packet and it had like slots for like 30 envelopes. And we set a budget and we canceled all it. Like we, I don't know if it canceled, but we, got rid of every credit card we had, like put them in a safe um, and said, we're never going to use another piece of plastic until we're out of this mess. And we just went, when I get my paycheck, I go take it all in cash and we would divide up the money into these little envelopes based on what we had that month. And everything got paid cash. And like, it's drastic, right? I mean, even Dave Ramsey has suggested this, but it's, it's super drastic, but drastic times call for drastic measures, right? And here's the remarkable thing is that as soon as I did that, nothing, I, I didn't notice a change at all in my lifestyle. Nothing, except all of a sudden I was making an extra thousand dollars a month instead of losing an extra thousand. So all of a sudden I was spending like two grand instead of four, but where did that two grand go? I have no idea to this day. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Logically, that makes no sense. But just spending cash subconsciously made me spend less money and, and seeing what I was spending. So somehow I just spent thousands of dollars a month less than I was before. And we had traction again and we could start saving and we could start paying off debt. And that's, uh, that's when everything changed. Awesome. So, so you start saving and yeah. what, what, what is the first thing you do with the surplus? Like, do you, what, like what, what was kind of the we, action plan? Did you follow the yeah, baby steps? We did follow, I mean, for the most part, we, we follow the baby steps in that we, we went and got, I think, emergency fund first. We saved up a thousand bucks for an emergency fund, took and started paying off the lowest, like the lowest credit card debt. Now, 
I didn't, I didn't pay off a hundred grand in credit card debt just by saving a thousand dollars a month. Like that would have taken me forever. What I did was I got better at business. I got better at the flipping houses thing, not significantly better, but enough that we started flipping a few houses a year, making 15, 20, $25,000 on these flips. And over the course of about three years, we paid off all of that credit card debt, mostly using flips and a few burrs in there, a few, which we call burrs where you, it's like you flip a property, but instead of selling it, you just hold onto it and you go to a bank and get a new loan. So you, you kind of just pay off the old loan. Anyway, that's how I paid it all off. So, so during this process, you hit rock bottom, you start saving. You're still working at the bank at this time? Yes, the bank was during this time, yeah. And do you work in the bank the whole time while you start flipping two or three houses a year? Uh, it was around, I only worked at the bank for, I think 18 months or something like that. So I quit at some point and here's why I quit because in that process of the flipping and the paying off the credit card debt. So we were still in quite a bit of credit card debt. I would guess if I had to guess 50 grand still in credit card debt, when you do what any 24 year old, I think it was 24 at the time, what any 24 year old with 50 grand of credit card debt does is I went out and bought a 24 unit apartment building. So, uh, and I did the whole thing for no money down, like basically no money out of pocket. I bought this 24 unit, but what that did, and I can go into detail if you want to know how I did it, uh, but I used a variety of creative strategies, but I bought this and all of a sudden I had an extra like three grand a month coming in or $2,400 a month because it was about $100 per unit in, in income. And combine that with the other rentals now that were producing a little bit of cash flow, I now had $3,000 a month in actual revenue coming in and I was still only spending about two grand. So I said, all right, I did it. Level one financial freedom. And I, <laughs> and I uh, was able to quit my job in there. So. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to derail this, but I do want to derail this. Like, like your story sucks. You're horrible with money. <laughs> I have a hundred thousand dollars in credit card debt and I don't know how I'm going to pay it off. So why don't I yep. just go buy another house that isn't worth anything? There you um, go. So knowing the end, yeah. it's a really incredible story, but what made 23 year old Brandon think that he could possibly buy a 24 unit apartment complex? Not 24 year old Mindy right now doesn't feel like I could go out and buy a 24 unit apartment complex by myself with no sure. money down just because. Why fortune, did you? Fortune favors the bold, Mindy. <laughs> I guess, but like, I mean, I know you personally. I don't want to say you're cocky because that implies, <laughs> I mean, you're not cocky. Cocky is a jerk I'm, and you're I'm not confident. a jerk. You're very confident, but you just had these little ones and twos. How could you go from that to 24? 24 units is a big, it's not a small multifamily. That's a yeah. medium at the very smallest. I mean, that's still, yeah. that's, a, that's a big jump. Yes. How did yeah. you, how did you just, I mean, where did you find it? How did you discover it? I do want to go yeah. into that a little bit. All right. So the, the short answer was, um, I read a book called The ABCs of Real Estate Investing by a guy named Ken McElroy. Uh, so Ken, I had the privilege of meeting him for the first time. In fact, I got to introduce him on stage and it was such like a cool moment uh, at, uh, at a conference last year. And I read this book and I was like, it's all about apartment complexes. And I was like, shoot, that's what I want to do. I want to go apartment, I'm going to go larger multifamily. I'm going to get into that. So I read that entire book and then they have, there's a sequel called The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing. It's also about apartments. I read that the same day, two books, one day, was obsessed with this. I went to church the next morning. I tell this old couple there, I just read this a really amazing, they, like I, they, they kind of had been following me, not mentoring, but like they've been talking to me every week about how I've been doing and what I'm doing in real estate and stuff, but they were kind of interested in it, uh, just in the topic. So I told them, I wanna buy an apartment complex, that's what I'm gonna do. And they looked at me kind of funny and I had no idea that they were, that they were real estate investors at all. Like I just never asked them. And they said, well, that's funny because we actually have an apartment that we wanna sell. And so they ended up selling that entire 24 unit to me using what we call seller financing. So seller financing is where, it's kind of like if you were to sell your car to your brother and your brother didn't have money. He like, you give him the keys and you say, okay, it's your car now, but you got to pay me a hundred dollars a month until, it's, until the total amount's paid off. That you're, that you know, the car is, it's five grand for the car. So pay me a hundred bucks for the next 50 months and you can have, then it's, you know, yours. Same thing with, with the building. So I started paying them a, a mortgage payment every single month, but I took over. And it was not passive. This is not passive income. This was me working at the property, doing all maintenance, all management, all repairs, everything. I was there every single day fixing this property up and working it. Uh, and that became like essentially my full-time job. I mean, that's all I did was worked on this apartment for about a year or a year and a half. Wow. That's it. So what was your, <laughs> no, I mean, it's just it, gathering up all these things. Like I have a thousand questions for you. What was your mortgage payment 
to them and what were you bringing in? Sure. So originally, I mean, I'm going to have, have to guess on some of these numbers. So I don't remember. It's been a while, but they were, they were super nice. Cause they, so it wasn't that they were just nice. Yes, they were super nice, but let's go in their shoes. They're 72 years old. They have this apartment. They don't want to manage. They don't want to deal with this apartment building, but if they sell it, they owe a ton in taxes to sell it. Plus like when you sell a property that just, there's a lot of mess or they got to go buy something new or how are they going to make income? They're trying to retire. They want to travel around the country. They have a big RV. So their problem was we have, we can't travel because we have this big property. And if we just sell it, we have no money coming in now. So what they did is they sold it to me knowing that they could trust me. And this is, this is just an important lesson about like everything I had done up to that point didn't make a ton of money, but what I was doing was building I was building my own confidence in that I knew what I was doing. I was building education. Like I understood how real estate worked. I was building work ethic. Like no matter what, I would not let a property go bad. I would not let, and like these people saw this over years of time. They saw that I was building really integrity. Integrity is just doing what you say you're going to do. Uh, and I proved myself as somebody who would just do and, and do what they say they're going to do no matter what. And so they built that trust with me. So they sold it to me and I took over and owned that property for, I think we owned it for another, we just sold it like two years ago or two and a half years ago. Uh, and it was a great property while we owned it. it. Took a lot of work, but yeah, it's great. And and so what, what, when, when you got that property, what would, what was kind of the trajectory following, following that? Was that, was that yeah. the real like boost? Yeah. So somewhere in there, I mean, we kept acquiring like little deals here and there. Like I went back to about a duplex. We flipped up like maybe one or two houses a year, made a little bit of money that way. Uh, and Kind of one, once the thing got stabilized, I was bringing in consistently then from all the rental properties uh, and everything. And then maybe the flips, probably 30, uh, I was going to say from the rentals, 30, $40,000 a year, and then maybe an extra 20 from the flips. But that was still paying off credit card debt and just kind of trying to wipe that out. So we just slowly started kind of not doing anything. And I remember when I was 27 is where I officially said, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm like done. Uh, and I, I kind of just... I say I retired and it's a bad, it's kind of a bad phrase because you never really retire when you own rental properties and you're actively involved in them. But what I mean by that is like, I, like I said, I'm done for a while. I'm not going to buy any more. I'm just, I'm not going to go get another job anywhere. I'm just going to relax and just sit on the couch for a while. So I did that, uh, for a while because at that point, again, we're living on like, we're living on a budget now. We actually got that under control. Uh, and was making again more money than we were that was going out, and we were paying off credit card debt with these flips, and we were just about out at that point. So that's when I uh, I said I'm I'm stable, I'm good, I feel good about my 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 future, and that's when I uh, became friends with this guy named Josh Dorkin, who uh, was around that time. Josh Dorkin was the founder of BiggerPockets.com, and we became friends. And he wrote a thing on his Facebook page that said, "I'm looking for somebody to help me manage blog posts," and I said. I could manage blog posts. Can I do it from Washington state? And he's like, okay. So that's how that started. I started, I was senior editor of the bigger pockets blog, very first employee ever. I was making, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I was making $40,000 a year. And, uh, my whole retirement lasted a total of like three months, I think. And I started making money from bigger pockets. So I think that's interesting. You, your whole retirement, even at age 27, when you could literally do nothing, your whole retirement lasted three months because nobody who can retire will retire. I'm a firm believer in that. that like is, nobody who can. Yes. Will. No, absolutely. I 100% agree with you. Uh, so you yeah. start on at this little known website. Little known website. I mean, there was, there was still like 100,000 members. I mean, what are we today? 1.4, 1. 1.5, 1. something like that. So like 1.6, really? Wow. So crazy. We... I started on like, yeah, we had just crossed the hundred thousand mark. I think I was actually member. I, I didn't say this earlier. I found bigger pockets when I was 21, I think, um, very like before I bought any rentals before anything. And I found it cause I typed into Google or dog pile. I think it was dog pile at the time. What to do when tenants don't pay rent. So that's when I found bigger pockets. I'm, I think I'm member number like 8,000 or something like that from early on, something like that. Maybe 10. That was early. Uh, anyway. So yeah, I started helping out Josh and I remember just thinking, I mean, this is so funny. I remember just thinking like, he's going to pay me $40,000 a year. Like, and I'm already financially free. Like I already have enough money to live. I'm so rich right now. Like <laughs> I remember just thinking I'm like me and okay, actually this is a true story. So I hope Josh doesn't listen to this. So maybe, he, maybe it's okay. He does at this point. I remember in negotiation, I think he first offered me like 35 maybe. And I was like, 
my gosh, $35,000. But like, I got to negotiate. And so like I wrote back. <laughs> so I wrote an email to my wife and said, Josh has offered 35. And I said, I'm going to push back and ask for like 42. And I sent it. And then I realized I didn't send it to my wife. I sent it to Josh Dorkin. And so like, <laughs> I literally told him in an email how excited I was about like this. And like, I, I never talked about, it. he never brought it up and I've not brought it up to him to this day. It's, I don't know if he just is being gracious to me and not making me feel like a complete moron. I have never said this out loud to anybody other than my wife. And now I'm saying it to everybody listening that that was the worst negotiation of my entire life. So anyway, he got a terrible deal. Yeah. Terrible deal. But no, this brings up, okay. So this brings up, <laughs> so I'm making 40 and here's what Josh's pitch to me was, well, we, I made, I made about that on the conference, the first conference. So I, I got about $40,000 uh, that I can put towards a salary. So if you don't make back more than this, this year, you're out of a job 12 months from now. Like that was the pitch. I'm like, all right. Wow. And that's when, that's when we started the podcast was, uh, I'm like, let's start a podcast and see if we can make money that way, which never happens. But, uh, that was the whole idea. And so, um, yeah, awesome. 40, I was, but okay, let me, let me say something before you jump in. Sorry, Scott, I'm ruining the, your, your question here, yeah. but I want to actually give you props here because of something you defined is one like, this is in your set for life book. It's like, once you achieve that, like level one financial freedom, whatever you like, once you can, you're, you can now take risks that other people can't do. And I never thought this at the time, but you said this later in your book and it perfectly illustrated why. Most people out there could not have just gone and taken a risky job at a startup with one employee, like being the first employee making 40K a year, unless they had already like, because I was already like financially free. I'm not saying nobody else could have done it, but I was able to take that risk. Yeah, great, I'll do it. And I was excited about it because that was just extra money for me. So I could take that risk. So once you have that financial freedom, you can take bigger risks to go and do bigger things and impact the world in bigger ways that if you're consumed about money that you wouldn't do. hundred percent. That's the whole like point of what everything that I like to do here with yeah. financial freedom is, you know, your retirement's going to last three months. Sorry guys. We use that as the carrot. We try to, yeah. you know, <laughs> margaritas in the beach, which is a big yeah. thing. Brandon, you know, has some margaritas in the beach, but he works just <laughs> as hard as ever. You know, it, it's, it's really, if you achieve financial freedom or some semblance of it early yeah. in life and get that control or, you know, at least, you know, before retirement age, you have yeah. a chance to go on and make a huge downstream impact on, on the world like Brandon here. Like me, I can, it, yeah. It's, it's true though. Like I, it's, and it never was even early on financial freedom. The, the, the drive for financial freedom was never about getting rich. I never wanted to swim in that, like, you know, tank of uh, gold coins with Scrooge McDuck. Financial freedom for me was always about two things. You want to buy the New York jets. I want to buy the New York jets. <laughs> <laughs> it was always about two things. Number one, I wanted to make sure that when I was a dad, because I love kids. I knew when I was going to be a father someday, I wanted to be there for every soccer game, every dance recital, every scrape knee on the playground, whatever. Like my, I mean, my dad, I love my dad, but he worked 50, 60, 70 hours a week all growing up. And he had to, because that's what people do. And I'm not faulting him for it. Like I love my dad and he worked incredibly hard, but I said that there has to be another way. And so my drive was that someday I would be a parent who could be present when I needed to be in the life of my kid. Not that I don't want to work. I knew I would never stop working really, but I wanted to be there. So that's what drove me there. How, how, how many hours a week did you drive? Did you, did you work in this period when you were driving towards getting to this, this point, this inflection point, like in, in the build up years, you know, yeah, working no, at the I, bank and flipping houses. My wife and I talk about this actually a lot is there were so many nights where we would be working at 2 AM at a rental property, painting the walls, finishing the caulk lines because we had a tenant moving in at 7 AM the next morning. And I know people are listening to this right now, especially those real estate people out there, but any business people are like, you should have hired that out and done something different. But here's the thing. I believe the reason that I am where I am today is because I was willing to paint walls at two in the morning, then wake up four hours later and sign a lease with a tenant because you do what has to get done. That's that integrity piece that like, if you say you're going to do something, you do it and you just don't deviate from that. So yeah, easily, easily putting in like hundred hour work week, especially when we were both working jobs. My wife works Starbucks through this whole thing up until we were 27 when she finally, 28 maybe, was able to quit Starbucks. Like we, 
like we would just work our jobs and we'd then flip houses and then we'd go take care of our rental properties. And you just, life was about hustle. And how, how, loved ma- it. how many hours of self-education did you put in, in those early years as well? I mean, like constant when it ma- came to reading and networking, such like bigger pocket stuff. Like I was on there all the time on the forums. You can go back and read my early forum stuff. Like it's humiliating, but like, I'm thinking about <laughs> buying this 24 unit apartment building. And people are like, you're a moron. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I'm still going to do it. Uh, and like, I don't, it's funny. Like I, when I look at my story, yeah, like I did so many things stupid and I spent money in frivolous ways and I did stuff that I would not necessarily recommend. And I flipped houses on credit cards and I bought houses on credit cards and I bought, I don't regret a bit of it. I don't regret a bit of it because every single thing got me to where I am. Now, would I tell my kid to go do it? No, but I don't regret doing those things. Um, they got me to where I am. Maybe lucky, maybe just like supernatural blessing. I don't know. Like for whatever reason it worked. Uh, but uh, I am who I am because of that. So I don't know. That counts for something. You know, I'm really glad to hear you say this because people who are just discovering bigger pockets now are seeing Brandon Turner, the Uber success yes. story. Brandon yeah. Turner knows everything there is to know about real estate. Brandon Turner can do no wrong. <laughs> Little um, do they know. Um, <laughs> and this is a great episode. I'm going to bookmark this on okay. my for on my uh, dashboard so I can go back and when people are like, oh, Brandon's the best ever, I'll be like, hey, hey, hey you should listen to his <laughs> early stories because he yeah. did no squat. You, you can title this from moron to millionaire right there. There you go. <laughs> that I'll, might be I'll, a better I'll one. <laughs> I'll, no, I'll claim I, that. I like my original title from financial disaster to real estate master because you were a financial disaster. I didn't a realize what a dis- what a disaster. I, I'm trying, well, I'm trying to come up with a word that isn't a bad word, but you well, were terrible with money. I, I was not good with money, but you know, what's funny is I, in all those years, I missed one credit card payment. My entire life was ever late. And it was cause I was on my honeymoon. Literally. I just forgot to pay it when I was on, I was in Mexico for my honeymoon. The only time I've ever been late on a payment ever, except for, no, I did have a private lender one time who I could not month after month after month could not figure out how to send them the proper amount at the right day. Um, Mindy at one point, I don't remember that, (laughs) but other than that and the credit card thing. Yeah. There was a period where uh, Mindy was my private lender and I, every month there was some issue somehow with getting you the right amount in the right day. But other than that, yeah. Like we caught up. We made this, we, we figured it out. Like I was literally like have to send Mindy like a 30 minute video of like on a whiteboard, like, okay, so this money went here and it's, it's, <laughs> I paid two payments here and I actually sent a third, it was all like trying to automate it. It was like, okay, my bank sent three payments here for some reason. And so we didn't pay for two months because of that. But like, anyway, it was a disaster. Yeah, I am I not very organized. Loans. I think two yeah. loans were the same amount. Yeah, two exactly. different times or whatever. Yes. It all worked out. Yeah, um, it was... But no, this is really helpful to hear this because Brandon Turner on the real estate podcast right now on episode 370 or whatever you're up to, you're perfect. You're, I mean, not, you know, <laughs> well, perfect clearly, is a, clearly, clearly perfect is clearly. a big stretch, but you're doing a lot of things that people want to be. You are somebody that they aspire to. And when you first, your first interaction with Brandon is this, you know, I have 5,000 units. You're like, Oh wow, he must be really amazing. And it's nice to hear that you also made mistakes and you were able to fix them and you have come out ahead and you've learned. And you know, one of the big things that I see on the bigger pockets forums all the time is people are like, Oh, I don't know how to get started. Yeah. Just get started. Yeah. I mean, don't just buy like whatever house, but you started because it was cheaper to buy than to rent. That's the case in a lot of places. That's the case right now in my place. Yeah. I know that. No, that's not the case. I don't know where I'm going with that. Never mind. (laughs) (laughs) You know, to, to interrupt, like it's, I really believe like it's more important that you make a decision than that you make the right decision. And what I mean by that is, like people, people persever, persever, I don't know the word there. I'm bad at words. Uh, I, they perseverate about decisions like, Oh, should I flip a house? Should I rent it? Should I start this business? Should I, um, do this thing? And like, they do that for years and never actually take action. So what I like to teach real estate people, and I would teach any business owner in any way, any entrepreneur, any side hustle, you are never going to get rich off your first deal. The point of the early stuff is not to get rich. The point is to hang on and get some education without losing. Like that's really the point. Like, so in real estate, the point of the first deal is not to get, make millions of dollars off that first deal. So I don't care. People are like, well, 
you know, Brandon says to buy a property that makes $200 in cash flow, and this one is only going to make $87, so I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, yeah, but who cares? It's $120 difference or whatever. Like, just get the deal done. And again, I don't want to tell people to think I'm saying buy a bad deal. Don't do that. But don't feel like you have to measure your level one with my level nine because what I do today is exactly what you do. It's more important that you make a decision and just start taking action than you're trying to get the perfect action or the perfect next step. Yes, 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 yes. Because you are going to learn a lot on the Bigger Pockets yes. forums, but you are going to learn so much more, more actually doing it, dealing with yeah. the tenants and dealing with, you know, the, the sob stories. And you're like, oh, I really want to rent to you even though you have 76 evictions. Yeah. Don't do it. But yeah. you know what? Go ahead and do it and see what happens. Oh, yeah, watch. number 78. Like yep. it's just, yep. but now you know, oh, I'm not going to fall for that sob store anymore. I'm not going to take cash. I'm not going to take a personal check. I'm not going to, you know, all these different things. You just have to sometimes experience it. And yeah, when you're doing a flip, yes, absolutely don't buy a bad deal. But when you're doing a flip, if you make a dollar profit on yep. your first flip, that That's is a, a home run Agreed. flip. Agreed. Agreed. Of course, because I'm right. You're all right. I have a couple of kind of just general observations about your story here. Um, sure. One, your time at this, at, at going over this was, was relative, like, and I'll just, you know, this is maybe mean, but I'll just say it anyways, was not yes. very valuable, right? You're making minimum sure. wage at Coldstone Creamery and then yes. at Wells Fargo, right? Yep. Or whatever it was, the bank. I think it was yeah. Wells Fargo. Was it? US Bank. US Bank. US Bank. Okay, great. Right. So you leveraged your time to work on these properties yeah. and get a huge spread over time and capitalize on that in those early days, right? And I suspect yeah. you have a very different value on your time today where you have a, in a very different approach to how you leverage that uh, yeah. at, at this point in time, right? Well, what, so, what drives me nuts sometimes is like people look at certain tasks like that's below me or I'm not going to do that. And we maybe mask it inside this idea of like, well, you know, my best dollar per hour is actually doing, you know, whatever. And, and maybe that's true. But in the beginning, like I had to do what I had to do. I had to do any work at all whatsoever. But there is a certain degree of like, if I'm watching TV, that is $0 per hour. So I watch mm -hmm. very little TV. Uh, and I always have, I mean, we'll, if it's nine o'clock at night, we will watch some Netflix and Game of Thrones or whatever. But like, I, I don't sit around watching Dancing with the Stars every night and waiting, you know, like I, I'm always trying to figure out like, how can I get some more value out of this time? And if that means spending time with my family, great. But anyway, so there but you go. I wanted to observe that because if you're if if you were in a job that was paying a hundred thousand dollars a year, you yeah. might have had a different approach to some of that that early real estate investing. I'm sure, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I think at the time when I'm earning almost no money, that yeah, real estate was a great approach. And like you and I, you and I have talked about this a lot. If you're making hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a year, in fact, I generally tell people not to go into real estate specifically. And here's what I mean by that: is in anything you start. Anything you start, it's like a, it's like a, a curve, right? It's like a, what's the exponential growth curve called it? Maybe it's called an exponential growth curve. And anyway, it. <laughs> okay. At the bottom of the curve, like you're at the bottom and you're, you're not making any money. Your dollar per hour is crap. It's a struggle. And you start learning more and more and more and more. And then it starts to go up and goes higher and higher and higher until your value, like your value in that business is really high. So then people who have spent 20 years and now they're way high in that curve, curve in their consulting business in their meat cutting business. I don't care. All of a sudden are going, I'm going to go start real estate and make it rich there. And I'm generally like, I mean, that's fine. But if you're on that part of the curve, you're way better off finding a way to maximize those skills that you're starting up high than trying to start back at zero with a real estate career. Unless you just absolutely love that. No, I'm not saying don't invest in real estate. Just give your money, like buy something simple, buy something small like you're doing, like buy one deal a year, but don't go say, I'm going to go flip houses now as a job when you have no skill or ability to flip houses. Unless yeah. There's you a, really love that. I think, I think there's an easier way to financial yeah. freedom in this, in a similar period of time than what you went through for someone who's earning a high income. Yes. It's, yeah. And, and the second, the second observation I, I would have is, well, a question, I guess. What was your balance sheet? What was your net worth? Was you kind of peg it at in the ballpark of it in terms of the equity you had when you quote unquote retired? Yeah. I mean, if I had to guess a couple hundred grand, probably, uh, I didn't cross, I crossed a million dollar net worth when I was 30. And I remember sitting at a Starbucks and I, I was, I was, I found out a loan application. I was doing all like, what are my properties worth? What do I owe on them? Going through this. And I got to the bottom, it was like 1.03 million. And I was like, Oh, weird. I'm a millionaire. 
And then I went back to drinking my peppermint hot chocolate. And it was like, it was a cool moment, but like, I, I expected like somebody to like ring a bell and it didn't happen. <laughs> and that was a, that was a weird moment. Um, but, but, but very, it, very few ahead. people would be comfortable with the concept of retiring with a balance sheet of just a few hundred grand. It sounds like yeah. two or three hundred thousand dollars. That's because is, is the because most people follow the crap. And I know you guys are make fun of me for this, but like, what's it called? The four percent rule or whatever. What do you call it? Like, yes. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent garbage. Exactly. So like, four percent. Now from four percent, right? Like they're like, oh, if I had a million dollars earning four percent return, I would be able to live on whatever that is a year. And I'm, I'm like. Like, I don't believe in a 4% return. I mean, if I'm getting less than a 15% return, there's something wrong. And the only way to do that though, is being very active and being really good at what you do with real estate or with anything. I mean, I'm sure you could get a 15% return owning a Tupperware door-to-door salesman business. Fine. But that's what I would rather choose than, than passive investments in the stock market at 4%. And again, I know like everybody listening to that thinks I'm an idiot right now, but that's but fine. You got I don't think the- anyone, yeah. Go ahead, you got Eddie. the 4% rule wrong. Did you're not get getting a 4% okay. return. You're, okay, you're taking it? out 4%. Okay, fine. Whatever. Of your total. Investment. So yeah. So you have a million dollars in the bank, then you're taking out 4%, 40, which yeah. is 40,000. 40, yeah. So, but I mean, if that doesn't work for you, then don't hang your hat on it. Yeah. You but I, that's where like people think they need millions of dollars to retire. You don't like, and, and at least like, sure. It'd be nice to have, but I'd also take just cash flowing rental properties and th- that would work for me as well. I don't care how much equity I could have negative equity, but if I have cash flow and rental properties, then I'm doing fine. I can retire on zero net worth. Well, but you retired with a couple hundred thousand dollars and enough cash coming in to cover yeah. all of your expenses. Yeah. You it's the just- cash flow that matters, not net worth in my mind, in terms of early, like level one financial freedom is all about in my, my mind, level one financial freedom is a, is a cash flow game, not a, not a net worth game. Later on net worth matters and it matters a lot. And I care a lot more about that today, but yeah, who cares if I'm, if I own a property, let's say I own a million dollars of property today and it was worth a million dollars. I have zero net worth but it's producing a hundred grand a year in a hundred percent passive income. Do I care that I have no net worth? Not at all. All I care about is the fact that I'm making cash flow. Now that's an absurd example. Like nobody's making that, but there you go. Love it. So, so that, I, I think that's just extremely telling between those, like those are just two things that I picked up on where, where how you leveraged your time and what I picked up as a spread between the value of your time and the, the activities you were doing, right? Is, is you, it was not, you could not pay people more than you were earning um, less than yeah. you were earning to do the work that you need to do on those properties. Most likely, right? Probably. Second, yes. You retired with a balance sheet that would be crazy for most of the listeners in the show yet made perfect sense for you. And the third thing, um, is, is asset allocation, right? So where was almost all of your net worth was in real estate, I presume, right? Yes. Yes. Did that change after you joined Bigger Pockets? You'd retired and joined Bigger Pockets. Did you begin investing in other asset classes over the years, or do you still almost entirely put your money into real estate? I have one other investment, and I I I believe you tell me. I think we have a four hundred one k offered at Bigger Pockets. Maybe <laughs> yes, you we, guys we automatically m- contribute to your four hundred one. You might put money if into you are, it uh, if you receive a salary from Bigger Pockets. So you I, you have some you money in there. So I have an investment <laughs> somewhere. I have zero idea how much is in there. I have you never put a dime in there. You don't invest in your four hundred one k. Why would I? I, I canceled this whole recording. <laughs> so here, I'm going to give some really unpopular advice. Let me tell you what I don't do. I don't put money in a 401k. I don't put money in a four, uh, IRA. I don't put money in a self-directed IRA. Okay. I don't put money in a solo 401k. I don't put money into life insurance. I don't put money into anything. I believe 100% in putting all my eggs in one basket. This is not popular advice. No. And here's, right? But I believe, me personally in putting all my eggs in one basket. And what I mean by that is one asset class because I cannot be good at what I'm doing with real estate if I'm also trying to be good at figuring out what the hell a solo 401k does for me and what a a Roth IRA. Now I'm my, I granted, I just sent over an email this morning to my assistant and said, will you set me up a 401k, a solo 401k? And he's going to do that. But I do not, my mind is a very small glass of water. It is not very big <laughs> and it can, it can only fit so much in it. It's half and full. It is. A, <laughs> no, it is. It is very, it is a half cup that is fully full. And if everything I put in there, something has to come out. 
So I would not be where I am in real estate today if I tried to be good at anything else. I'm pretty convinced of that because to be good at anything else, it would require mental bandwidth that I don't have. And I know that's unpopular advice and I'm not saying everyone needs to follow that, but I'm all about diversification within one asset class, not multiple asset classes. Okay. I'm glad you used the diversification word because, yes. and I, I do know that you don't just invest in single family homes or yes. I mean, you're everywhere, but why don't you invest in something like an index fund in the personal finance space? The index fund is the darling of the community and you just set it and forget it. And you put your money in, you put it into VTSAX and you never look at it again. And then you're a trillionaire. Why don't you follow that? Have you, have you, you've heard that index funds. You've heard that. So I've heard that if I were to, if, yeah, if I were to put in, uh, you know, a thousand dollars, uh, a month into my index fund and hold it for 45 years, I will be the richest guy in the graveyard. And I'm really excited about that, about being the richest (laughs) guy in the graveyard, because all those other corpses are going to look at me and be like, man, that guy's got it. I am so glad you are not, you should be so glad you're not here right now. I would punch you. No, you don't put a thousand dollars in Scott. What were we just talking about? We were talking about, uh, who we wanted the bigger pockets money podcast to be for and what we wanted to do. And we want to encourage people to put large sums of money invest to invest large sums of money from a position of financial strength so that they can grow their financial, uh, grow. What are they growing? Their finances. They're growing their finances and like saving for retirement and all of that. So why you don't put anything in index funds. It's not a thousand dollars. It's like, $25,000 $25,000 a year. That'll grow okay. a little faster than your $1,000 a year. Not that your $1,000 a year sure. is piddly, but it is. Um, I, because I don't know if I put it into an index fund, I have no idea. And this is my personal, I just have no idea what that's going to do. And I know on average, it's probably going to do seven to 8% uh, over time. But I also know that I will not buy a real estate deal that doesn't give me 12% cash on cash return. I just won't do it. So in my mind, I would rather say, I mean, let's, if you want to do some extrapolation of numbers, 25 grand a year at 7% interest or 25 grand a year at 12% interest, put that out 30 years and show me the difference. It's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, and so, but can you invest in real estate for $25,000 a year? Easy. I, I mean, I put a half a million in last year. Yeah, and but, I put a half uh, million uh, this year. Brad, but, uh, no, we, you put a half st- a million in. But yeah, don't, don't interrupt, Scott. You put <laughs> a half a million in. Can you buy anything for twenty five thousand? I'm saying people who don't have a half a million sure. just sitting around sure. to put into real estate. What are you going to get for twenty five thousand versus putting that into index funds? You put that in now, and I mean, there's probably going to be a market correction. Sure. I'm not predicting yep. anything, but. I'll predict you know, it. It's coming. It's coming. Well, thanks, Brandon. <laughs> what day is that? What time is it going to oh, I don't crash? know. I'm just saying it's coming at some point. <laughs> I'm going to predict so, the nose. So, you know, what kind of real estate, and I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate because yeah, I please. do believe in real estate. So I, I think this is such a powerful can you discussion. you buy for yeah. $25,000 a year? Yeah. I mean, you could buy uh, plenty of real estate. I mean, pretty much anything in between Western, sorry, Eastern Washington and Western New York state and everything in between there, you can put $25,000 down for a down payment on a hundred thousand dollar property. Pretty much anything in the Midwest you can find for hundred grand, not in Denver, not in Austin, Texas, but pretty much everywhere else. Yeah. For, so it's doable. I hundred percent agree. And to Mindy's point, we were talking about, you know, the goal here, if you want to move toward financial freedom, you need to accumulate a material, a meaningful amount of capital yeah. every year in yep. rapid in more and more rapid succession, right? So if yeah. you're saving five thousand dollars a year, that's a good start. No, no one's got laughing at it. But you really gotta be accumulating twenty five, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a year over time and, yeah. and accelerating towards that goal, right? And there's a number of different ways to do that. If you're on the lower end of the income spectrum, real estate's probably a really good way to go yep. ahead and, and start learning. Read some books, leverage that, you know, buy some of these properties, figure out how to ex- explore that time. If you're, or if you're at the higher end, buying bigger real estate can also make sense. But if you're at the higher end of the spectrum, making two hundred thousand dollars a year, you know maybe then it makes sense to like work your seventy hours a week that you're probably working to make two hundred thousand dollars a year and yep. plow it into an index fund, burning seven or eight percent a year, and you're going to be in financially free within five to ten years just on that. 
but yeah, like I think that's that's the point here is you have to accumulate that cash, that capital yes. in some manner, or you have to create it the way you did, right? In, in order to get started here. And, and once you've got it, it's all about that that long term allocation. And there's no wrong answer to that, uh, yeah. except for, for you know, Brandon says. Just, you should probably just do it all in real estate. And well, and I, actually, I don't care about, I don't even care about real estate. I really don't. And I'm not saying that you should not put money in real estate or you should put money in real estate. It doesn't matter. Here's why I put money in real estate though, is because one, it fires me up. I love it. And I'm willing to become the best at it. You should put all your money into whatever fires you up and you can be the best at. Um, you know what actually the best investment in the world is, is not real estate. It's not stocks. It's not index funds. It's people. What I mean by that is like, I like, in fact, this year I'm hiring five, I have five people now, well, four people that I'm paying like to run my, my, my real estate business because every one of those people, I might pay them a hundred grand should make me a million dollars in revenue. Like uh, people I think is one of the best investments you can make. So at some level, some of you guys have businesses out there. Your best, at, you know, your best investment is not sticking 25 grand in an index fund. It's hiring a person for $25,000 to manage your inbox. So you can go out there and earn another hundred thousand dollars doing what you do best. I love it. I think I, 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 I would agree completely with, with you conceptually here, right? Like how, how do you Thank get, you. how do you get to the point where you've accumulated enough to get to that point where Brandon felt at 27, where I am retired, I, I could, I can do whatever. And then, then this world of opportunity that you can see on like the bigger pockets business podcast or in bigger pockets, real estate podcast, like those become accessible to you in an incredible way. And you can kind of play that whole next level, next game. It's yeah. like, um, if you're played cash flow for rich dad, yep, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. yeah. There's like two tracks, right? It's like yep. the first track is these like spin your wheel, you go around and you like have an income, you have expenses, you have a baby, you have a doodad, whatever, you yep. know, and you're stuck. It's a rat race. Once you get out of the rat race, it's like, Oh, it's buy so much a, cool stuff. Uh, yeah. 24 unit apartment complex, meet the mayor, meet Ken <laughs> McElroy and introduce him at a conference, <laughs> you know, fly, you know, whatever it is. And, and, yeah. and that's, that's the game. Right. And, and this like what we're talking about here, this money story is how to get out of that game so you can play the next game, the yeah. big game. And and a hundred percent. And this is why it's so dependent upon your like what you do and where you're at. Cause if you're like a teacher earning thirty thousand dollars a year, like it's a very different strategy to get financial freedom than what Scott Trench is doing or Mindy is doing or I'm doing. Like ever like if you're earning hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year at a job that you absolutely love then you should not leave that job and go flip houses. If you're doing, if you're a teacher, you should consider flipping houses because it will bring in mass amounts of money that you can then dump into other things. And you can't find ways. If you're a car salesman though, and you like being a car salesman, I'd spend all my time learning how to be a better car salesman. And I'd take my income from hundred a year to 800 a year because you're already on that curb. So it's just knowing where you're at right now and knowing what the best path is for you. And that's why podcasts like this are so fun because you get to hear all different perspectives uh, of what's optional, but yeah, we can't just give someone advice. Like don't do real estate or do real estate. I don't know, but this is what works for me. Love it. That's well, this has been, to end. Yeah, this has been an amazing discussion. That was here. my mic drop right there. Anything else you want to add before we get to the famous four? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's about it. I think that's it. Buy real estate. It's fun. Buy real estate. It's fun. Okay, perfect. Uh, it's time for the famous four questions, Brandon. These are the same four questions we ask of all of our guests. Are you ready? I'm ready. I hope they're different than my famous four questions. They're so different. Okay. What is your favorite finance book? Mm. Can I give three? Of course. This is your show, Brandon. Anything you want. All right. So the first one's called the book on rental property. Invest I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's my book. Uh, no, uh, I'm going to go with the first book that changed my life, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, followed by the second book that changed my life, which was um, Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover, followed by the third book. I don't know if I'd call this changed my life, but I really liked it a lot was The Richest Man in Babylon. I'm sure all of those have been said before, but uh, they're all good books. Richest Man in Babylon is my favorite. Oh, fourth book. I'm going to give one more because it's really good. And it is personal finance in a way. And it's a very financial freedom book. It's called Life and Air. Have you guys read that one yet? I know Scott, oh, you read it. I love that book. Yeah. Love that book. It's like a millionaire, but instead of the word million, replace it with life. So life and air. Uh, it's a tremendous book about uh, what true financial freedom is and how to obtain it. So it's very cool. Awesome. Awesome list. You should read all of those books. Um, okay. So what was your biggest money mistake? <laughs> <laughs> so everything, I, everything, the first no. hour of this show. What, what was, what's the one okay, piece I, of advice? Oh, 
I'll go. I'll go. I got a good one. Uh, so I flipped a house one time. I found this awesome house. I was watching all these flipping shows early on in my career. Really wanted to flip this property. I was excited about it. And so I, I bought it. It was a duplex. I turned it into a single family house, did all the work myself alongside my wife. We like literally like ripped out the staircase and put a whole new staircase right up the middle of the house, like this grand staircase. It was, I mean, I built it with my bare hands, replaced all the windows, paint, carpet, like cherry hardwood floors, granite countertops. I mean, it was like, unbelievable house. And we sold it. We listed it at 170,000, dropped it to 160, dropped it to 150, dropped it to 140. Finally sold it for 120 at, after like a year of owning it, over a year of owning it. I broke even on that property after everything said and done. When I ran the numbers, this is not a plug, but this is true, true story. When I ran the numbers afterwards on the newly built bigger pockets rental property calculator that I'd built at that time, I realized that had I kept it as a duplex, I would have been making $1,100 a month in cash flow. And it would have taken me eh, two weeks to get it rent ready for a duplex. But instead, I wanted to flip that house because that's what people do and that was cool at the time. And I was greedy and wanted money. But uh, that was a big money mistake. Don't do that. Wow. That's a great yeah. one. What, uh, what su separates successful people from those who give up, fail, or never? Oh, wait, that's not the right. <laughs> that's like, I'll answer that all day long. <laughs> I got a hundred answers to that one. It's integrity, but keep going. Other, what's, your, what's your real question, Scott? I think Mindy's got this one. Okay, Mindy. Uh, what is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? Starting out in life? Breathe. Next. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> starting out with their finances or starting out like out of college. Yeah, starting out on their financial journey towards their financial, financial journey towards financial independence. Always do what you say you're going to do. David Osborne gave this advice at the BPCon 2019, where he said integrity is not just doing what you say you're gonna do to for other people. It's do you say do you do what you say you're going to do to yourself for yourself? How many times do we say I'm gonna go and go to the gym and then not go, or I'm gonna save a hundred dollars and then not save the hundred dollars? You are lying to yourself and you are the most important person in your life. So if you can't hold a promise to yourself and hold that integrity, you're never going to be able to make it anything in this life. So build trust with yourself. Be integrity full. I made that word up, but I'm, I like it. Integrity full. That's Wonderful. a terrible word. It's a That's great a word. Book. It's a great and piece of it's, advice. It's a great piece of advice and a great word. You're going to start using it now. Integrity full. You I'm heard it here first, in folks. Be integrity full. And be integrity full. Make that a tweet. We know we know that you're not very funny. So, but, I'm but not. You, have you prepared a joke? Do you have what? What is your favorite joke to tell at parties? <laughs> I mean, if somebody said this joke before, stop me. This is this was voted the funniest <laughs> joke of all time on Reddit. So somebody may have said this, but there's two guys. Have you heard this one? There's two guys uh, out hunting in the woods, and one of the guys falls over and he's not breathing, and so the 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 hunter who's still standing calls nine one one and says, and they say nine one one, what's your emergency? And they say, or he says, my friend, he's just dropped over. I think he's dead. And the woman on the, the 911 said, well, calm down, sir. The first thing we need to do is make sure he's, to, to make sure he's actually dead. And so all of a sudden she hears a gunshot and he says, now what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was voted the funniest joke of all time. I think not, like, that's a great way to come it's, up with a joke. Uh, I know, gonna, right there. I'm going to recite yeah. the funniest one of all time. All right. <laughs> We've never heard that one on the show before. I'm so that glad. Is funny. That is a funny joke. The other one, the other one I use at parties is, or on stage is the, the classic, uh, I just flew in from New York. Boy, are my arms tired. But um, get it? I flew in from yeah. Yeah. Oh, flew, I got it. Flew. Very nice. <laughs> you asked me for a dad joke earlier, Mindy, so that's my dad joke. Oh, yeah, that's a bad joke, not a dad no. joke. Right. <laughs> the, the last question or, or command is, is well, well, I'll phrase as a question this time is, do you have any like published works or places online where people can follow what you're doing? Or, I'm kind of a recluse. Or you in general? Scott, kind of, he's not a published yeah. author like you and I are. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be. Uh, I keep putting submissions into Katie, but she doesn't want my underwater basket weaving book. So I'm going to just keep trying. And well, maybe I'll get be it. integrity full, Brandon. I'm gonna. That's my new book. Is gonna be it's called like Be Integrity Full. Yes, I, I'm gonna. You know do what? It. I know Katie, and I will get that pushed through for you. Be Brandon. integrity full. All right, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, 
You can follow me on Instagram. I'm like a 13 year old girl when it comes to Instagram. Nice. I'm in a current race to get to 100,000 followers with Investor Girl Brit. So don't follow her, follow me. And uh, uh, how, how, how would they follow you, Brandon, on Instagram? On you Instagram. didn't give your oh. Instagram handle. Oh, geez. Mindy, you saved my life. I know. Beardy Brandon, beard with a Y, Brandon. And you can find my books wherever books are sold, except for uh, airports. We're what are those books called? There's too many to name. I just keep writing them. The but the book, book on rental, the, the book, book on, on rental, rental property investing. Oh, whatever. that book. That's the, the book. book. On, I, I just called it the blue book. The blue book, the yellow book, the black book, and the journals, and yes. a couple others. Yes, the Brandon's yeah. published works. The entire collection of Brandon's published works can be found at biggerpockets.com/store. The show or, notes or search. Sorry, search. Amazon for Brandon Turner or Audible, and you will find not only my books, but there is a Brandon Turner who is a narrator of erotica. So, (laughs) win-win. There you go. You can find Brandon's books at biggerpockets.com slash store, Brandon. Uh, (laughs) Or Audible, where you can listen to... Not Brandon. Not Brandon Turner. Talk about things you may not necessarily want to listen with your children. Don't listen listen with your kids in the car. Yeah, gross. Anyway. Okay. Uh, Yes, and (laughs) all of these links can be found at our show notes, which are at biggerpockets.com slash money show 100. 100. Brandon, I really appreciate you taking time out of your oh-so-busy life of surfing and living in Hawaii. Having, having a baby. A baby. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, baby. I'm really Tomorrow, glad you took time out of your life of having yes. a baby. All no, the- you, don't, you don't understand how hard it is, Mindy. Oh, I don't, don't know Please how hard tell it is. Me. No, but let me tell you, let me, let me give myself a pat on the back real quick right here, just real quick and talk about how great I've been lately. So my Please. wife, my wife has, uh, is, is due in a month, but she is, uh, the baby's coming early, like very early and they're trying to keep it in. So they've kind of put her on basically bed rest, not quite bed rest, but basically bed rest where they don't want her doing anything physically active that might pop out a baby. So what that means is I have been in charge for the past week of cooking and cleaning. And let me tell you, it's amazing. Like I literally like make breakfast, do the dishes and it's noon. And I'm like, now wow. it's time to make lunch and I do lunch and then I do the dishes and it's dinner time. And I don't understand how my wife did that before because <laughs> all she, all you have time for is cooking and cleaning and taking the dogs out and that's it. So I have a new found respect for all stay at home moms who well, are also trying you. to run businesses. It's, it's an, and jobs. Like it's a ama- It's amazing. I don't know how you guys do it. So now I just go to dinner like three nights a week or five nights a week, which wow. is great for finances. I just put it on credit card. We're all good. Okay, Thanks. great. Back full circle. Put it on credit cards at the beginning, put it on credit cards at the end. We'll pay so it off with the next flip. We'll pay it off with the next flip. There's always money in the banana stand. All right. Well, there is always money in the banana stand. Brandon, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yes, I don't know that much of this. I have not heard much of this story. Um, I try to keep I, it under wraps. So we're going to not publish this episode. So thanks. Oh, totally. Yeah. We're totally <laughs> not going to publish this episode at biggerpockets.com slash money show 100. Um, okay. So, well, thank you. I'm going to let you go in case she's, you know, she might be birthing a baby now. Yeah. Um, can't wait to see pictures. Thanks. I can't wait thank, to see Thank you, Brandon. Okay. Bye, thank you. Bye. All right. That was Brandon Turner from biggerpockets.com. Uh, Mindy, what'd you think? I love his story. I mean, I hate his story. He is a total disaster when it comes to money in his twenties. Well, didn't he have, Oh no, it was real estate. I was gonna say, didn't he have a website called money in your twenties and it's real estate in your twenties. There's a lot of rhyming in this show today, mm-hmm. which I don't mean to do. Um, but he was a disaster with money in his twenties. And it's nice to hear that he has changed his life. He has turned his financial situation around and is now level two retired or level two financially independent. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing that he was so, so bad and then came so far from that. Right. And it, and it makes you wonder, you know, because he read Rich Dad Poor, he read all these books. He took a lot of action. You know, are there, you know, it's kind of like, it kind of makes you wonder, can anyone do this? Like, what is the worst possible position that you can think of someone finding themselves in financially from this? And and it's making minimum wage and $100,000 in credit card debt, right? And he took That's a the lot worst of, position I've ever heard of. 
that he's definitely really low on the totem pole mm-hmm. when we come to, you know, hooray success stories on this show. But he took action to change his financial life. He didn't just sit back and say, whoop, found myself in six-figure credit card debt. I guess I suck with money. I'll just declare bankruptcy and never do anything else again. He continued buying rental properties, which I don't necessarily agree with, but clearly was the right thing to do. Um, And it's just, it's a great story of how taking action and moving forward in a positive way will yield success, will help you grow wealth, will grow massive wealth. A hundred percent. And I just, I, I keep coming back to the, the, that I don't think we've had a guest in the entirety of the show who some people have had more debt, but it's like, Oh, I had $200,000 in educational debt because I got me, I was getting an advanced degree to make 80, $90,000 a year or something like that. Right. Nobody had, nobody's had close to six figure or, or six figure debt and had, you know, 15, $13 an hour wages. He was making $5 an hour at Cold Stone Creamery. Yep. Or 525 or something. I mean, I, it's just astonishing how bad he was with money and how far he's come. And I really, really am excited that he shared it with us today. Yeah, it was a wonderful story. I, I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. And I hope um, everyone learned something from it that, that they can take away a little nugget that maybe will help them grow their financial positions. I hope so too. And, you know, at the end, towards the end, he doesn't invest anything in index funds. He's only in real estate, plus like the $12 we put into his 401k or whatever. I am surprised that he doesn't invest anything in the stock market. Um, And I was arguing with him about that, but clearly he has discovered the secret for him to build his wealth. And that secret for him is real estate. And he wholeheartedly believes it and he's really good at it. So why should he diversify. Well, he should diversify because you diversify so you don't put all your eggs in one basket. But this is Brandon Turner holding his basket of real estate eggs. I think they're not going to break. Yep. I, I agree. I can't, I can't argue with his logic for him. Correct. Correct. He has the, like you pointed out, he has the education. He self-educated over a long period of time and he's optimized every resource that he has. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, should we get out of here, Mindy? We should. Uh, I don't have any clever exit lines today, so I will just say from episode 100 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen, and we are leaving. 